綺麗だ<笑> And you're go. Is it on? Okay. Welcome. We're about to get started. What a wonderful turnout. We are so excited to see all of you here this evening. Thank you for coming. We think we have a wonderful、uh, program planned. I- I'm Michelle Swenson. I'm the executive director of Global Women's Leadership Network. Um, and we are one of the founding members of the Bay Area Alliance for Women and Girls. We're going to kick off the program just about now. And one of the things we wanted to do to open is,、um, is have Nisha Hathi of Schwab come up and say a few words. Charles Schwab has been just a wonderful partner and incredibly generous in providing the space for this evening. So, Nisha, let me turn it over to you. Th- thank you, Michelle. So, I am usually up on the stage and I talk for a long time. And,、uh, and today I'm really happy to not be、uh, part of the primary part of the show, but just be here to welcome all of you.、Um, I know there are some Schwabies in the audience. Schwabies? Okay, ex Schwabies? <laughs> um, so, we are thrilled to be hosting an event、um, of this caliber in the Schwab Center.、Um, we're fortunate to be able to do this every once in a while and thrilled to have such a great audience today,、um, such a diverse audience from all, all of these various organizations that support an incredible cause, which is around empowering the women and girls in our community and around the world、um, and, and just doing more. And so, we're excited to have all of you here.、Um, I hope that you enjoy the event. I hope you.、Um, Um, enjoy uh, uh, the participation and the networking with each other.、Um, and I hope tonight、uh, you know, opens your mind to just another idea, another,、uh, another aspiration of something you can do to help further this great cause. Thank you, Nisha. That was wonderful. And thank you to Charles Schwab. So I'm going to spend two minutes and tell you a little bit about the Bay Area Alliance for Women and Girls.、Um, Let me start with our mission. The goal of the Bay Area Alliance for Women and Girls is to catalyze and support collective action to radically empower women and girls. To catalyze and support collective action to radically accelerate the empowerment of women and girls. We believe that one, a single organization working alone is not going to be able to solve the really complex societal problems. That many women and girls face today. And so we're creating a framework for collaboration, a way for us all to work together. We refer to ourselves as the Bay Area Alliance because we're all located here in the Bay Area, but many of us have a global focus, and we actually think that our impact can be global, and that's certainly our intent. The Alliance is new, it was founded in November of 2013. When 60 women and some men got together representing 30 organizations. And we focused on really two fundamental questions. The first question was how can we radically accelerate the empowerment of women and girls globally? And the second question was how can each of us better scale our work, have greater impact, and more effectively sustain our work? And could we do that if we intentionally collaborate with one another? The answer to that second question was a resounding yes. And so we have been focused on figuring out what form that collaboration, that collective action can have. The, collect- the model of collective impact that we envision certainly is based on existing models of collaboration, but it's also a new vision. And so the Bay Area Alliance for Women and Girls is definitely a work in progress. Um, I personally find that very, very exciting、um, to be on the ground for, floor of something with this kind of a vision and this kind of excitement. And the kind of event we're doing this evening is just an example of the kind of collaboration that we can go, do going in, in the future. The Alliance currently has a six member steering committee.、Um, I currently chair the committee. And the other members who I'm going to name and wave when I call your name are Annie Wright of Women's Funding Network. Betsy McKinney of the Founding Family, Denise Dunning, Let's Girl Live, Let's,、um, Let Girls Lead, Emily Marase, San Francisco Commission on the Status of Women, 
and Jane Sloan of Global Fund for Women, who actually isn't here tonight because she's in Nepal. Um, we are seeking additional alliance members. We want to expand the steering committee. So please come talk to me, come talk to any of the steering committee members. Um, check out our evolving website, bawag.org. Get on our mailing list. Um, and again, talk to any of us over the evening. Thank you so much for coming. And it's now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Mary Pittman, the CEO of Public Health Institute, and also one of the founding members of the Bay Area Alliance. Thank you so much, and uh, welcome to everyone who's here tonight. It really is exciting to have a sold out event. I'm going to take just a moment to tell you about the Public Health Institute because you'll be hearing uh, a lot from Denise Dunning later, one of the programs of the Public Health Institute. But we're one of those really well-kept secrets. We've been in the Bay Area for 50 years, and I bet a lot of you haven't heard of us. Our mission is to promote the health, the well-being, and the quality of life for people throughout the world. We were established in the Bay Area, and we work in California, we work nationally, and, and we work globally. We're a nonprofit organization, and we work to create environments where people are able to achieve their greatest potential for health. And that means that we work on infrastructure, leadership, and the practice of public health. And we define that very broadly. We define public health as really taking a look at the economic, environmental, physical, and social determinants that affect how people live and whether or not they're healthy. And these are very complex multi-sectoral problems that PHI works on. So one of our core values is collaboration. And that's one of the reasons why we were so excited to see the BayWeg, as we call it, uh, the Bay Area Alliance get up and going to deal with issues of women and girls. It's so important for us to be working across our different boundaries of our organizations. We can't do this work alone. We all bring something unique to the work. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the Public Health Institute, as I mentioned, and we also just recently, on April 1st, were given a wonderful award as one of the 50 top nonprofits to work for in the U.S. as awarded by the Nonprofit Times. And I think about what makes us successful. Why have we had the longevity? Why have we had over 6,000 people work with us over 50 years? And it's the team. It's the incredible staff that we have. And we have a number of staff from PHI here tonight. Could you just raise your hands? Be recognized? Okay. Great group of people who are dedicated to improving the lives of people throughout the world, and particularly the folks here tonight, women and girls. I am really proud that Denise is serving on the steering committee, and we have a deep commitment to seeing this effort grow. So uh, I urge you to take up the offer to join the alliance. Let Girls Lead is an example of one of the programs at PHI that has a strong reach for empowerment and advocacy for girls. Let Girls Lead has several components, and you'll be hearing more about it when you see the film. But it has reached over 3 million girls with its advocacy efforts in Latin America and Africa. It's a global movement of building champions who are able to protect girls from violence and ensure that they can attend school, stay healthy, and learn skills so that they can escape poverty and build a future for themselves. There's um, also a focus on child marriage, and this is an issue that's really near and dear to my heart. Throughout the world, there are many girls who don't have a choice whether they're getting married and getting married at a reasonable age. And one of the areas that Let Girls Lead has focused on is reducing child marriage as a human rights violation with multiple consequences. Child marriage can mean the end of a girl's education. It can mean increased health risk for her with an early pregnancy. And it limits her chances for financial and economic stability. And it disempowers her from being able to really have a future that she defines. So this precious asset of young girls is something that PHI is dedicated to working on. And I am now really happy to introduce Denise Dunning, who is the founder and director of Let Girls Lead.
Thank you, Mary. Um, at first, I just want to start by thanking Misha and Michelle and all of the other members of the Baywag Steering Committee that are here, and actually all of you who are here for the West Coast premiere of Poder. We're really excited to get to share the film, both with the folks who are here live in the audience, as well as with the virtual audience. So you'll see over there, um, there's a live Twitter feed of people tweeting in questions and comments from around the world. And we're really excited to engage the global conversation, both in the film and in the panel discussion that we'll have afterwards. I'm just going to talk really briefly about the film. But first, I have to do one more thank you, which is to my incredible team at Let Girls Lead. So I'm going to ask them all to stand up wherever they are um, and give a wave. So this is a group of incredible advocates for girls who work incredibly hard to empower girls to reach their potential and transform their own lives, their families, their communities, and the world. And I personally feel incredibly grateful to get to work with such an amazing group of women. So I just want to thank you guys. Um, and now, so I'll tell you just very briefly about the film. Um, many of you probably have seen um, the e-blasts that have gone out about it, and I won't tell you too much because I don't want to ruin the suspense, but just want to give you a little bit of context. So this is a film that uh, tells a story of some of our work in Guatemala, which began in 2009. So Let Girls Lead's model essentially invests in leaders and organizations in countries that are working to improve girls' health, education, livelihood, and rights. And it's really an incubator model. So investing in those leaders and organizations so that they have the resources, the training, and the funding so that they can actually take their work to scale. And so you know, when we first started this work, we were really fortunate to meet a woman by the name of Juani Garcia, who is one of the people that you'll see in this film. And in 2009, Juani graduated from our first cohort. And you know, she'd finished our leadership program and was this amazing champion for Mayan girls in Guatemala. And she finished the program and said, you know, I don't actually want to advocate for girls. I want to advocate with girls. And she created an amazing program that launched a national campaign to improve girls' lives in Guatemala. And essentially, the rest of it is history and the subject of the film. So I won't tell you too much more about it, except to say that um, in terms of creating the film, we worked with Juani and the girls throughout the process. And so they created their own story, are actually playing themselves in the film, and have been a part of the process from the beginning. So I'll leave it at that, because I don't want to ruin any of the suspense. But I look forward to the discussion afterwards. Thanks. Announcing tonight's honorees is Jennifer Buffett, president of the Novo Foundation. It is an honor for me to introduce two amazing women who are tonight's recipients of the Let Girls Lead Award. This annual award is given to outstanding individuals who, through their life's work and dedication, show that when we invest in girls, we build a better future for all. We will first hear from Dr. Emmeline Cabrera, followed by the Honorable Elba Velasquez. I am so grateful for this award. As girls growing up in the small town of Concepcion Chiquirichapa in the highlands of Guatemala, both Elba and I faced numerous obstacles. But lucky for us, that all started to change when I turned 11. Every day after school, I would look forward to meeting with my dear friend Elba. We would meet next to the Mayan calendar outside our school and talk for hours about all the interesting things we had learned about that day. Hola, ¿cómo estás? Muy bien, ¿y tú? 
Elba was three years older than me, so I was always excited to hear about the subject she was studying, and I'd ask her endless questions. One boy in particular, Hector, was always teasing us about our commitment to our education. En lugar de estar aquí, deberían de estar en la casa. No, no entiendo. Y lo único que ganan aquí, en serio, son es embarazarse. No, no lo que viene aquí sentido. en esa escuela. Y supuestamente a estudiar. No, 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 no entiendo. No, 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 Ustedes no, vayan no, y déjenos concentrarnos. En verdad no entiendo a los chicos. En vez de estar perdiendo el tiempo molestándonos, deberían estar haciendo lo mismo que nosotros. Sí, algún día va a ser mi asistente. <risa> I could never spend as much time with Elba as I wanted. She was the oldest of six siblings, so she had a lot of responsibilities at home. I like to stay away from my house as much as possible because of all the fighting. It was hard to see my mother trying to take care of us all alone. Often, I felt like I should drop out and start working, but school was an escape for me, and I enjoyed participating in my class discussions, so I struggled to continue. One day, my teacher told the class about Let Girls Lead, a new program that would teach girls like us to become community leaders. I couldn't wait to tell Elva. <laughs> We decided to visit the woman who ran the program. Her name was Juani Garcia. Hola chicas, bienvenidas. Cuente, ¿cuál es su nombre y por qué les interesa formar parte de este programa? Porque queremos ser lideresas de nuestra comunidad y ayudar a I knew immediately that we were going to like Juani. She was a strong woman. She was educated and had traveled a lot. She looked into our eyes when we spoke. I watched her as she explained this new program that would help girls in our small town to learn new skills, such as public speaking and working with adults. Elba and I always used to talk about how our sisters, friends, and others were treated in society. We wanted to change that, but we're just a little too shy and too young to figure it out on our own. Now we had the chance to learn how to make our town a better place for girls. Throughout the workshops, we learned how to better communicate with local authorities, we learned about human rights and how to talk to the media, and we developed leadership and advocacy skills. We realized that what girls in our community most needed is support to finish school and stay healthy. So we decided to talk to the person who could help us make that change. We went to talk to the mayor. Little did we know Hector was in our shadows. We decided not to give up, so we came back the next week. I shouldn't have been so surprised to hear this from the mayor. 
This was the same problem my grandmother said helped cause our country's 36-year civil war that killed so many of our people. Women and girls' voices were too often silenced in our homes, at school, and in the government. Helba and I knew we could have changed that for our generation. We could have helped to build a more peaceful country. After the mayor rejected our request, Helba and I gave up. We went back to our normal lives and we stopped going to the leadership workshops. We felt defeated. After all, what good are we as young community leaders if the people making decisions for our community don't respect what we have to say? Elva spent more of her time leaving. I tried to spend more time at home. But the dream of building a better community for my people never left my heart. I started thinking about the power of women and girls, about my mother enduring extreme hardships to keep me and my siblings safe. I thought about Elva's grandmother and what she sacrificed for her family. And most of all, well, I thought about Juani, who was a strong woman I deeply admired. And I remembered one thing she said to us at our first meeting with her. Girls, don't worry about the opinion of others. Your participation and input is important because you are important. Elba and I decided to go see Juani again. We brought a copy of the municipal code and told her we wanted to know how to get the mayor to talk to us. We needed to find a way to make him listen and understand the importance of investing in girls. Juani told us she had an idea to convince the mayor to help us. This time we had a hook. When the mayor opened the door, we explained to him that we wanted to talk about making the community safer for all girls, including his own daughter. This time, the mayor opened the door to welcome us in. In the few minutes we had with him, we shared our concerns and we talked about the ongoing threats to girls' health, education, and future. We asked for his help. The mayor told us for change to happen, we would need to complete well-documented research about the problems facing the girls of our community. The mayor asked if we would work with him to create policies and a strong plan that the government could implement. We gladly said yes. We asked parents, teachers, and other people living in our town about the biggest challenges facing girls. Soon we realized that many people knew about the violence and poverty facing girls and did not know how to help. Community leaders told us that early pregnancies often prevented girls from finishing school and that the lack of jobs and training made it nearly impossible for young women to earn money. Through our research, we learned that less than 10% of mine girls finish school, and more than half have babies while they're still teenagers. With Wani's help, we submitted a detailed policy proposal to the mayor to fund programs that would make our community a better place to grow up and Finally, one day, the mayor invited us to his office saying he had some good news. Well, 
when the mayor signed and gave the official stamp on new policies and funding, Elba and I were so excited. These policies would support girls to finish school, see a doctor when they needed one, and reduce gender-based violence. These policies would transform girls' lives and improve our whole community. Even our biggest skeptic, Hector, couldn't believe we reminded him of how he and Jose were teasing us as we were working to improve the community. We told him, you were always welcome to work with us. You just didn't seem interested. We decided to forgive Hector because we realized that in order to be effective, we needed the participation of men and boys. We needed them as our allies. <laughs> We were so excited for this day. Seeing how proud Juani was of us was a testament to her vision and leadership. She believed in us from the start. She gave us everything we needed to be powerful, and we loved and respected her for it. And there was one new participant we were happy to see join Buddy's workshop. A few weeks later, we joined the mayor in the grand opening of the municipality's new office for women and children, which focused on ensuring girls can go to school. Oh, it was a very exciting time. I even got to help cut the red ribbon. So as you can see, both Elba and I stand before you today as two women who grew up in one of the poorest regions of Guatemala, who have proven that when you let girls lead, you are helping to transform communities, countries, and the entire world. Because of everything we learned, we have gone on to finish graduate school. I am now a doctor, and Elba is a judge. And we continue to help build better communities for other women and girls. So thank you again for this award. And please, always remember, never underestimate the power of a girl. Okay. Is this on? Is it on? 
We're going to move into the um, panel discussion now. First of all, I just want to say that, Denise, that was truly inspiring. Congratulations I mean, to you and your team. That was just wonderful. It was just wonderful. Um, I now have the pleasure of introducing Claire Winterton, who is going to be the um, moderator for our panel, and then she will introduce the other panelists. So Claire, at the far end there, is Vice President of Advocacy and Innovation at Global Fund for Women. And we decided in the green room that is probably one of the best business titles ever. <laughs> As some of you may know, that is a relatively recent and new title for Claire, who for the past five years has been leading the International Museum of Women and its inspiring work around the world. Claire's new title and expanded role is the result of the recent merger between the International Museum of Women and, global, and the Global Fund for Women, a process that Claire championed and led. The intent of that merger is to create a bold new force to increase awareness and action on vital global issues for women. To quote Musimbi Kanyoro, the CEO of Global Fund for Women, by combining Global Fund for Women's on-the-ground expertise and networks with an international museum's creativity and dig digital advocacy, there is a unique opportunity to make a deeper impact than ever before. Now, we've been talking about collaboration. What a great example of how collaboration leads to greater impact, greater scale, and greater sustainability. Claire holds an MBA with distinction from Cambridge University. She's clearly a keen strategic thinker she lives in San Francisco with her husband and two young children. Um, um, so thank, thank you, Michelle, for the very generous introduction. Um, I want to jump straight into introducing our incredible panelists, and I can't think of um, a better and more qualified group of um, passionate advocates for the power of women's storytelling. Um, that we have in the room this evening. I'm, I'm going to work my way through the panel sequentially and start with Dr. Denise Dunning. Um, you met Denise earlier. She introduced the film that you all just enjoyed um, and were all, I'm sure, very inspired by. Um, she's a passionate advocate for women and girls. She's the founder and the executive director of Let Girls Lead, which is building a global movement to empower girls um, to attend school, to stay healthy, to escape poverty and to overcome violence. Since 2009, the Let Girls Lead model has contributed to improve livelihoods, health, and education for more than 3 million girls. Um, she also leads Let Girls Lead Sister Initiative, which is called Champions for Change, which saves the lives of mothers, children, and newborns in Nigeria. She served as a Fulbright Scholar in Honduras, and she received her PhD in sociology from the University of California, Berkeley. She also has a master's in public, affair, in public affairs from Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School. So welcome. Um, and thank you for inspiring us all tonight, Denise. Jennifer Siebel Newsom is a filmmaker, a speaker, an advocate, and the president and the CEO of the Misrepresentation Project, which is a call to action campaign and a media organization, which she established to shift consciousness, inspire action, and transform culture. Um, as many of you know, Jennifer wrote, directed, and produced the award-winning documentary film Misrepresentation, which challenges media myths, stereotypes, and distortions around women. Jennifer was also an executive producer of the Oscar-nominated documentary The Invisible War, which unveils the epidemic of rape in the U.S. military. She's currently writing, directing, and producing two documentaries, The Mask You Live In and The Great American Lie, which explore how culture's narrow definitions of masculinity harm boys, men, and society at large. Welcome, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to have you with us. And Michelle Azlimba is the CEO of the Women's Funding Network, which is a membership network of over 160 women's funds and foundations and the largest philanthropic network in the world devoted to women and girls. 
She previously led the Georgia Campaign for Adolescent Pregnancy Prevention, um, and as a result of her efforts um, and her tenure in that organization, um, Georgia has achieved a 30% reduction in teenage pregnancy within a decade. So incredible work with that organization. Michelle has also been a lecturer in urban planning in the University of Nigeria and has served on the board of directors of the Atlanta Women's Foundation, the National Healthy Teen Network, and the National Advisory Council on Sexual Health. So an incredible group of panelists this evening um, to lead us in this discussion. Um, before we jump into that conversation, um, I wanted to share with you um, how you can participate, whether you're in the room this evening or whether you're joining us via the live stream. Um, as you know, the, um, as Denise mentioned, um, we're live streaming the event. We have a live tweet chat going on. Um, you'll see on the monitors at the back some of that live conversation. Um, if you want to tweet in questions and comments during the panel, you can use the hashtag investinggirls. Um, and those comments will appear. Um, we'll also be sifting through those questions for the audience question session at the end of the panel. Um, for anybody here in the room who wants to participate in the questions um, but who doesn't want to use Twitter, um, we also have old-fashioned methods available. You can use question cards, um, and if you raise your hand, um, someone will come around and pass you a card. We'll incorporate those, those comments too. Um, so with that, I want to just jump straight in um, and to ask all of you, starting with Denise, um, how is it that documentary films like the one that we just saw can help challenge gender norms that are so pervasive for women um, in this country but and around the world? So, so Denise. Yeah, I think that um, for me it's been a fascinating process to learn about how we can use storytelling and film in our own work to empower girls and women to be able to raise their own voices and tell their own stories in a way that is both empowering for them as individuals and can also lead to sustainable and scalable change. And one of the things that we have really, our goal with this film has been not only to help Elba and Emmeline and Juani and all the girls tell their story, but also to create a new narrative and push the conversation around girls in a new direction building on you know, some of the amazing films out there that highlight the problems and the challenges facing girls and women. We really wanted a film that illustrates girls' power to create change mm -hmm. and demonstrates really that girls are not victims, but actually are leaders and incredible agents of change. And that if we can invest in them, they can transform their own lives, their families, their communities mm -hmm. and the world. And for me, it's been an incredible learning process to see how the film is already starting to do that. Mm -hmm. Jen, can, can you elaborate from your experience, which I know has been so powerful and so extensive? Sure, sure, sure. Um, well, you know what's just interesting is that 80% of global media is American media. And if you look at American media and you look at women's representation in American media, it's pretty pathetic. So most of the stories that are being written and told and produced are written, told, and produced um, by and for men. And what's interesting about that is there's nothing wrong with men, and I'm so grateful to all the men in the room. Um, but certainly there's a large percentage of men, unknowingly, that have been socialized to almost bifur bifurcate their hearts from their heads, disconnect in a sense. And when you disconnect and you create media, you're creating media that isn't necessarily um, fully um, embodying of, of, of humanity, fully conscious of um, the need to, um, to, to inspire, um, create an um, a inspiration for a healthier world, um, tell stories that don't just involve you or people that look like you or act like you or behave like you. So what's so important about this is that when girls write and tell their stories. Their stories are given that, they're, they're um, exposed in a way that um, current media is not ex exposing their stories. And so that whole kind of concept, if you can see it, you can be it. We need more women's stories out there. We need to tell the stories of girls and women all over the world from every walk of life. Um, and, and that's really what this is all about. And, and it's a way to also take back media because you know the US is one of the most gendered uh, countries in the world. Right? So we so kind of bifurcate gender. We put men in this male box over here and women in this box over here. And it's quite damaging and quite limiting. So again, if 80% of global media is American media, 
We're, we're creating these, putting out these norms into the world that are ultimately going to harm other countries. And I've seen it when I've been in Abu Dhabi, when I've been in Singapore, when I've been in Mexico, when I've been in Canada, when I've been all over the world with misrepresentation, which three years later continues to have a life of its own. Uh, because people say, hang on a minute. Um, you all are sort of have exported the lowest common denominator of what it is to be an American to the rest of the world. And you've also exported really unhealthy gender norms. Mm -hmm. And so if we can, can take back storytelling and tell our stories, and if men of consciousness, more men of consciousness can speak up and out and tell healthy stories, they're authentic stories, not stories of, um, of um, that, that even stories that, that, uh, that ultimately even harm them. Um, but I think that we can create a healthier culture for everyone. So um, anyway, I am optimistic. And, and this, this is very inspiring. And I do think one last thing, like filmmaking, um, and in particular social justice storytelling, I think is the future. I mean, I, you know, if you think about it, um, I mean, we think about the Invisible War. What the Invisible War has done for exposing the epidemic of sexual assault in the U.S. military. We're, we're now making a documentary on sexual assault on the U.S. campuses that will have even more of an impact because just the time is right. And we've already kind of um, sort of, uh, 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 I would say, kind of awakened people's consciousness and moved the needle a bit with just the Invisible War. Misrepresentation, again, three years later, a film that's still like every, you know, four to five screenings a week somewhere in the world. When I was told, when I tried to sell the film internationally at Sundance, um, I was told initially that the film had no um, international potential. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, seven um, international, seven countries have, have broadcast the film internationally. It's available in 200 territories. Uh, we've had physical screenings in, in over 40, I think 46 countries, and continue to host screenings, like I said, daily. I was just in London with the film. So I say that because films have such um, opportunity to, to impact people and take them emotionally and um, to also um, to, to inspire them to be agents of change. So, so Michelle, from your perspective, how do, we, how do we take back storytelling and what do you see in the ecosystem of women's organizations that you, you're a part of? Thank you. Well, I, I agree with what's been said before by Jen and Denise. And I, I, wanna, I think that the power of the combination of the narrative and the visual is sort of like a mirror to our humanity. And I think that's why film is so important because you're looking in the mirror and you're seeing human beings and, and you, you connect. It's the emotional point you, you made, Jen. And, uh, and I think also uh, we're talking about it in the context of women and girls, but I think the visualization has, and just a combination of arts as activism, has been a historic part of social movements, in, at least in our history, for quite a while. So uh, I think we can learn from that, too. And if you what, what really sparked the civil rights to kind of get beyond the... <coughs> The, the advocacy was the real visualization of young kids being hosed in the South. And that really was the, imp that was the spark that fueled what we see now in terms of the 50 year celebration of the Civil Rights Act. So I think fast forward to now in the, in the same fight for the human rights and dignity of women and girls and the technology we have and the fact that we're not in community the way we were 50 years ago, that film can create community. Uh, because of our shared humanity. And I think ultimately, gender equity, humanity is really at the core of gender equity, isn't it? So that's how I see the power of, of what we looked at tonight and the work of Jen and others that we'll talk about later. So, and as women funders, we need to be front and center behind uh, this as uh, resourcing this effort because that's really also a big part of the power and, and scaling and mobilizing a tipping point of social change. Fantastic, thank you. So Denise, I want to bring this back um, very concretely to the Let Girls Lead model and um, why you, as somebody who spearheads that organization, um, felt that, that storytelling of this kind was part of the armory of tools that you wanted to use to advance that agenda. Why did you make that choice and why was it a natural complement to the Let Girls Lead model? And maybe you can just explain for the audience a little bit what that model is. Yeah, no, absolutely. So our model is pretty simple. And I find it really compelling. You know, we, it's essentially an incubator model. So we identify 
visionary leaders and strong local organizations that are working to empower girls in the areas of health, livelihoods, rights, and education, critically. And we really invest in them to be able to develop their own solutions and empower girls to solve the problems that they themselves are facing in a scalable way. So trying to go from, for example, reaching 25 girls in a safe home, which is what one of our partners in Liberia did, to getting one of the most progressive laws in Africa passed that benefits over 600,000 girls in Liberia and guarantees their access to education and their rights broadly. So that's essentially the model of really finding those people who are already creating powerful changes and helping them go from here to you know, way up there. And you know, when we first um, started really thinking about creating this film, obviously we've known Juani for years and always been so, I've been so impressed by her deep commitment, especially to working with Mayan girls who are you know, some of the most marginalized and vulnerable in Guatemala. And the fact that she was able to create a program where these girls essentially did something that's unthinkable in a place like Guatemala, of you know, going beyond what their great grandmother and their grandmother and their mother did of you know dropping out of school at 12 and having a baby at 14 and another at 16 and you know they're on up until you know they have six or seven children and you know working with a group of these girls to actually say what is it that you want. What do you want your future to look like? What are your hopes and what is your vision and how can I help you to create that? And so seeing how that translates in the film, you know, when we first started thinking about creating this film, we thought we want to go beyond um, sort of the, the choir, if you will. You know, I'm a public policy nerd and we write case studies and we do policy <laughs> briefs and I think that's all fine and good and very important but it's never going to reach a mainstream audience. And so we thought if we could use film and storytelling, exactly like Michelle said, to humanize who these girls are, not only that could be empowering for them mm -hmm. and a tool for strengthening their own advocacy, but also could both inspire other girls around the world to see the concrete changes that they themselves could create. So getting the idea, it, again, you see it, you can be it. Like seeing these girls doing this gives girls in other countries, both where we work and where we don't, the idea that they themselves have really unlimitless, uh, limitless potential mm -hmm. and that they could create these changes for themselves. So that was one piece. And then the second was really kind of what I mentioned in terms of focusing on um, the global decision-making community mm -hmm. that isn't really investing in these girls. You know, the reality is there are 600 million girls around the world who live in poor countries, who don't get enough to eat, who don't get to finish school, who don't get to see a doctor, who often are victims of violence in their families, often are married off to men three times their age. And the reality is that, you know, we're not doing enough as a global community to empower these girls both to improve their own lives and their families and their communities. And, you know, the research really shows uh, the return on investment in girls is enormous, right? So a girl who goes to school for seven years will get married four years later and have 2.2 fewer children than her next door neighbor who doesn't get to finish basic elementary school. And we also know that girls and women reinvest 90% of their income back into their families, unlike you know, boys and men who the rates are less. So we know that by investing in girls, that's the greatest potential to really A, end global poverty. Ban Ki-moon said it at the UN just about a month ago. So people are starting to recognize um, what this potential is. But the truth is that uh, the resources aren't really following either the research or the rhetoric around girls. And so we really wanted this film both to inspire girls themselves, but also for decision makers and global leaders to see this and think, wow, you know, if we could invest and increase our funding for girls, just think of what the world could look like. And you know, the reality right now is that two cents out of every dollar in international funding goes to programs for girls. So there's an enormous gap between girls' potential to create change and what we as a global community are doing to invest in those girls. And that, those are some of the big picture goals that we're hoping to achieve with this film. So Michelle, you know I'm going to look at you next to, uh, <laughs> to, to elaborate on the point that Denise just made about like where are, where are the resources behind women and girls. I mean, clearly you, um, you, you sit within the philanthropic community, but it, within a community that is very explicitly focused on women and girls. And, and I would just love for you to share, you know, what you see the trends as being, you know, is the money starting to follow women and girls as a result of some of these advocacy and storytelling efforts? And what will it take to create more of a tipping point? 
Well, I wish I had better news to share, but I have some moderate news to share. That is that you know WFN is really 30 years old this year. And uh, when the network was formed, it was precisely because of the recognition of the disparities, uh, gender and racial, in mainstream mm -hmm. philanthropy. And at the time, 3% of all philanthropic uh, dollars in the US were devoted to women and girls. Well, fast forward now, it's, we haven't cracked 10% yet. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of work to do here domestically to mobilize the philanthropic community um, in new ways of urgency and priority for what we were, what we're all here for. And that is that uh, without resource investment, we can have a lot of conversation, but do you really, um, it takes investment really to be serious about change. And uh, I would say women's philanthropy is still a bit marginalized from mainstream philanthropy if you look at the data and look at where real serious money goes. It's not to us. And so one of the things at WFN, our mission really is to increase philanthropic investment for women and girls. That's our core mission. So um, we are really ratcheting it up and looking at that data in anticipation of, of making that the calling card that we talk about every op opportunity to get, particularly in philanthropic forums where um, the women's funding network that is, as you mentioned in your introduction, the largest philanthropic affinity association of devoted exclusively to women and girls is itself marginalized in some ways from mainstream philanthropy. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, it's gonna take all of us to bring this awareness and I think um, certainly increase what investments we're already making to really um, see the importance of investing in uh, filmmaking because it's part of the current technology of social change, quite honestly. And so um, with that, that can also be how we, our grant making gets informed through our membership. And we're already seeing it in some of the uh, members who are sponsoring documentaries and participating in them um, in their local efforts. So we have a long way to go, uh, I would say, after 30 years, not, not reaching 10%. Mm -hmm. A lot of advocacy is needed. So. A lot more still to do. Yeah. And a challenge for all of us in the room this evening. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to shift a little bit back to um, storytelling and media and the power of media, Jen. And we, we've talked about the power that storytelling and media projects have to connect with people emotionally and um, maybe to move them to act and to become activists in a way that maybe the facts alone or the statistics alone can't. So there's, there's incredible power there. Um, but I want to talk about the sort of shadow side of that power that the media has, which you unpack so powerfully in misrepresentation. And just ask if you can speak a bit about what the negative power of the media can be and you know, why these efforts like Denise's and your own are so important in countering that power. Mm -hmm. So uh, just a little bit more about kind of even what, what we talked about. What can the negative influence of the media be? The mainstream media that is so pervasive, sure. what, what kind of story is that telling about girls particularly? Oh, yeah. Well, it's... Um, that I mean, it, a lot of things, right? Um, that women are, are objects solely for the male gaze. I'm um, just seeing a lot of that in in uh, Latin America and media too right now. In a way, that's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. I actually have been intrigued with, even though we have a Spanish um, language version of misrepresentation. Misrepresentation did have a TV broadcast in Brazil, and there was a lot of buzz around that. Um, and it's been in Colombia and Mexico, but it hasn't been in as many Latin American countries as one would think and as it needs to be. Um, and having studied um, and, and worked and lived in Latin America, it's sort of frustrating to me um, that, the, that it is, to a certain extent the region feels like, and you see it with the weather girls in the media, right? Um, and John Stewart had a funny sort of spoof on that the other night. Um, but, you know, it's damaging, right? It's damaging when girls only see themselves and their stories in the media purely as sexualized objects for the male gaze. Um, so you see that. Uh, you, you know, 20% of, I, I guess only 20% of global media are stories about women and girls, right? So even then, you, it's like they're not even represented. So their stories aren't even there. So if they are there, they're sexualized. If they're, you know, or they're just not there. Um, and, I mean, it's just, it's on and on and on. And then, I mean, I just think our media, to a certain extent, is, um, is very problematic because it's, um, you know, because of really this whole kind of, especially here in the U.S., but, um, you know, we're influencing the rest of the world, this sort of capitalistic bent um, of attracting eyeballs, 
uh, falling on the assumption or the historic truth, but not necessarily the future truth that only sex sells or that um, fear mongering sells. Um, there's just, you know, one wonders when am I going to get the news because it's so much about infotainment. Um, so we women and girls, I say this all not to be negative, but it's like we haven't been at the tables of power media. We haven't been creating the media. We're increasingly creating the media. We need to be at the tables of power. We need to be creating the media. And we need to help the men who are there, who are in positions of power, connect the dots with their daughters and their nieces and their sisters and their mothers and their, their, their wives. Um, because, and this is what I loved about this, your film is really it took the mayor thinking about his own daughter to take these girls seriously. And by the way, some of the most, um, the men that move me the most and the most sort of inspired men posting misrepresentation are fathers of daughters mm -hmm. who want their daughters to fulfill their dreams and realize their potential. So we have to connect those dots for, for men. And it's not happening enough in the media. And um, it requires all of us to really play an active role in um, connecting those dots, consuming the good media and not consuming the bad media, and that means all those tabloid magazines, and that means all those tabloid reality shows, and that even means the news that's really infotainment and that isn't really giving you the news. Uh, so there, there's so much that we can do. That's that's where the, the hope lies. Like, talk about activism, your role in innovation. I mean, it's really about us all mobilizing and using our power as citizens and consumers to stand up and speak out, and but also celebrate the good. Uh, at, mis or at the representation project we rebranded from misrepresentation.org to the representation project, we have this not buying a campaign that is about calling out the bad media and we've you know and and and, and negative sort of uh, products and we have actually shamed and um, had products and um, what have you pulled off shelves. So there is power in activism, tremendous, and that's really the future. And um, so I encourage you all to to really kind of. And utilize your tool, those tools as consumers to consume the good, not consume the bad, and speak up about that. So, Jen, you, you mentioned that uh, one of the things that was really interesting and compelling about the film was um, the dynamic and the way that the girls influenced the mayor and actually also their male peers. So, Hector, who is the one who's teasing them, but then ultimately that turns around completely and he becomes an ally and becomes a collaborator. The mayor initially is very hostile, but he becomes somebody who makes a very significant investment in girls in that community. And I wanted to ask all of you from your own distinctive perspectives, what is it that we can do within the women's movement to build those alliances and to bring men on board, as you were suggesting, Jen? So maybe I'll start with you, Denise. Sure, yeah, I think it's an incredibly important issue. Um, one of the things that we have seen to be really exciting in terms of how we and our partners can engage men and boys is actually in our work in Malawi, um, where our partners, um, two young women who run an organization called the Girls Empowerment Network, essentially got together a large group of girls in Malawi who you know, didn't have rights, were being married off to men three times their age, weren't able to go to school. And these girls launched a campaign to get village chiefs to pass bylaws that eliminate child marriage. So if a man marries a girl under the age of 21, he has his land taken away and he has to pay a fee of seven goats. And so, you know, it's sort of funny here in San Francisco sounding, but um, it's actually incredibly effective. And since they've started this in 2011, they haven't had a single case of child marriage take place in the region of southern Malawi where they're working. And the latest thing, actually, that I just learned this week that um, Faith and Joyce, who run Gennett, want to do is actually engage men and boys. And so really involving the fathers of the girls that they have been working with in this empowerment program to become, rather than you know someone to advocate against, actually an ally who can advocate with the girls. And so starting a really interesting initiative where they are actually encouraging the fathers to sit down with their daughters in the home and just share a meal, because in Malawi that's not typical. A father would not sit down with his daughter and 
have a conversation over dinner one night. And so starting very grassroots in the home and then engaging those fathers in a process where they themselves are advocating with chiefs on behalf of and with their daughters themselves. So seeing the ways in which in different cultural contexts and in different communities we can think creatively about the ways to see men and boys as incredibly powerful allies and partners rather than you know oppressors who are sort of pushing us all down. Jen, I know your two forthcoming projects focus on this very issue, so I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, no, I, um, I, I echo, you know, I think we have to kind of set the bar of expecting boys and men to be a part of the solution instead of the problem and, and know and trust uh, that they actually want to be. They just don't know how. So a lot of that is, um, well, clearly men can invest financially. They can invest their time. They can sponsor young women into leadership. Um, they can sponsor... Um, uh, young women in other ways, um, helping them to, p to realize their, their, their potential, um, ensure they get proper educations, etc. Um, and clearly, uh, you know, when men speak out and on behalf of women and girls, other men listen. And so all of you men in the room, I encourage anything you've gleaned from tonight, I encourage you to take it back to um, men in your lives, whether it's um, sons, brothers, best friends, colleagues, you name it, and have these conversations and share these stories and share these um, just little tidbits of information. Men tend to gravitate towards facts, not to generalize or stereotype, but um, even sharing kind of statistics about, um, you, you know, educate a girl, you reduce poverty, you know, you empower a community, et cetera, et cetera. This, this is all very um, important and helpful uh, if we're going to really better our society. Just a little s story. When my husband, he's been on uh, Bill Maher uh, a few times, and when, one time when he was on there with Gloria Steinem, and he was sort of spewing facts because he's a policy wonk like you, and, <laughs> and I, I compliment because I just, so I, I, I love the way, um, you know, I love when men stand up and speak out on behalf of women and girls. And, and he was complimenting what um, Gloria Steinem was saying and basically said something um, related to, you know, uh, single moms raising kids in poverty, blah, blah, blah. Like, this is a community that we need to really focus on and help in a big way. And literally, he received and I received so many calls and emails afterwards saying, thank you to your husband and, he, and thank you to him directly, just saying how invaluable it is, how powerful it is when a man speaks up and out to um, champion women and girls. It just completely, all of a sudden other people listen. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, you know, it's just, you know, it could just be us sort of flapping, us women flapping our mouths and the guys can tune out. But when a man does it and makes it important and, and, and values women and girls publicly, I, it, you know, it's like there's an earthquake or something. All of a sudden, you know, it's that sort of, um, that, that's where we can sort of reach that tipping point, I think, of change, is if more and more men sort of mobilize and speak up and out. So you all are, you are allies, and, um, and now it's your opportunity. It really is, and I see, I see that as the future, and I'm, I'm excited to birth the mask you live in this fall. It really is birthing a film, right? Um, and later, The Great American Line, because I think just the first thing I mentioned just about the socialization of our boys and men to disconnect your hearts from your heads. You can't cry. You can't feel anything. Um, just, you know, in, in any way sort of dehumanizing what's true and authentic to all of us about being empathic human beings who care about others. Um, that messaging has so damaged so many young boys who have become men. And if we can help you all, and I'm hoping our film and our, the movement will do so, to reconnect to your authentic selves, which clearly, if you're here in the room, you get it, <laughs> um, then I think more and more men will have the courage to speak up and out. And it's just about courage. I think, in a sense, we need more heroes, like real heroes, not, not Hollywood heroes. We need more of you all to be our heroes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think for those of us who are leading national women's rights organizations and, and, uh, and like us at Women's Funding Network, is to also contribute to what has been said earlier, but really be um, intentional in our leadership and invitational in our leadership of who gets invited to be part of this movement. Uh, and you know, the Half the Sky movement was about half the world being women and being left out of empowerment, but really you still have the other half. 
So it's about what does it take for us to be whole? It takes men and women. And um, I just want to applaud Jen on the her forthcoming film that you're maybe you're nine months pregnant since you're going to give birth soon. But uh, <laughs> my, my daughter's nine months. <laughs> yes, the uh, because I do think there hasn't been enough conversation about the socialization and how genders are socialized. That is sort of the an, uh, you know the antecedents to a lot of the things that we are now advocating to beat back and, and, and reclaim ourselves. The other thing is when men are in the room, that the power dynamic doesn't automatically shift, that they're in charge. And so we have to have the confidence and really stand in our space with, our, with women's way of knowing, with women's values, with what it is that we care about, that they embrace that agenda and not try to change the agenda. So I think it's possible, but you have to be very deliberate and intentional in leadership to create those environments for that to happen. Thank you. So I'm, I'm about to transition into audience questions. I want to remind you to submit your um, questions via Twitter or in the room um, via question card. Um, and I have a lot of great questions. So I'm going to try and move quickly, and I'll ask our panel to try and move quickly too. Um, the first question is about the conversation about girls um, overseas and in the developing world is um, always a hot topic. Um, but where is the conversation about storytelling and empowerment of girls in this community? For example, girls um, in the Bayview Hunters Point. Um, so, <laughs> um, so I wondered if anybody would like to speak to um, you know, efforts that may be taking place locally or ways in which girls in those communities could start to take charge of the story and the narrative. Yeah. I mean, I, I, we're... Um, you know, growing organ small organization. I never intended to start an organization, but I knew that someone needed to carry out the movement that we were building, and no one was doing exactly what we were doing. Um, so, uh, I mean, for, we're, we're increasingly speaking to young girls, middle, high school, and college age. And so, um, again, that you know, we're not the solution here, but we're an opportunity just to inspire girls to tell their stories. Um, and to take power into their own hands and become agents of change, architects of change. And so I would just encourage young girls to go to the representationproject.org and engage with us. We're also building out a Be a Rep program, uh, are building out our Be a Rep program and a new ambassadorship program, which will also speak to bringing in um, men and uh, men of consciousness. And uh, I'm really excited about that. But that's, that's all I can say from here. I just add that, you know, we too are not in, in what's the word? we're not a local organization, but I'm very uh, conscious about the otherness of poverty in this whole movement where it's, you know, it's just somehow outside of the U.S. It's mm -hmm. something where we can deal with. Here, uh, you know, our community has been invisible, and my hope is that with the Shriver Report and the platform that Maria Shriver has created with her report and her documentary, Paycheck to Paycheck is an opportunity for us to put the lens on the status of women and girls in this country in a way that hasn't been in quite a while. Because as you know from the economic situation in this country, of course it's relative poverty, but the face of poverty in this country is increasingly women and it's increasingly women of color and it's increasingly the, the increase in single women is happening more in among white women in our society now. And so the face of poverty is women. and. We need to not ignore it in the trend of the current philanthropic trend of outside the U.S. We have to have some champions here to support Bayview Community Young Women and the Alliance for Girls here in the Bayview, which is a, an organization of adolescent girls serving or, uh, organizations here in the Bay Area doing on-the-ground work. So creating opportunities for that work to become more visible, for the, the challenges and as well as the successes being part of our narrative, I think we all have an obligation in any way we can to create that and bring it on the agenda as well. And I would just mm -hmm. add super briefly, um, one of the things that we have seen that we've been excited is um, we created a Global Girls Conversation video contest. So when we were creating the film, mm -hmm. we thought we want to create a platform where girls can tell their own stories. And so we launched this video contest where girls around the world, including here in the US, you know, we got some from San Francisco, from Chicago, from other places in the US have submitted two minute videos talking about their ways in which they are creating and inspiring change for themselves, for their families, for their communities. And 
You know, in the end, we got 142 videos from girls in 26 countries really demonstrating their power <laughs> to create change. And I think that using those types of tools globally, right, because the U.S. is in the globe. So thinking about how girls here very locally and within the U.S. can benefit from and contribute to those conversations is also really important. Thank you. Um, I, I wanted to bridge into a question that um, I think it elaborates on some of what Michelle had started to say. Um, the, um, the writer of the question says, um, you know, let's talk about the influence of race in this conversation. Um, and um, what, what, what do the panelists have to say about the racial disparity between those who often advocate for girls' rights um, and those who are in need of and affected by such work? And I think interested in responses from anybody on the panel on that question. The disparity between those who are advocating and those who are, who, who are perceived, need, as, the perceived as needing the advocacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if I could just briefly go first, I'm not the face of race up here, but I guess I am in some ways, but, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not the poster child for this by any means, but, uh, I do think it's evident, at least in the tables I've been since being at Women's Funding Network, that what you see often is just reflective of what hasn't become mainstream in our societies, which is the power and the influence and the opportunities and what counts, what matters and what doesn't in the eyes of that power. So it's not that the uh, folks who are, it's not that we don't have advocates in our community, but it's segregated from what is considered mainstream. So you have to, again, have a very intentional uh, motivation and a commitment to go and find these, these champions who don't look like us mm -hmm. uh, if you're on my side or don't look like you if you're on your side because it's intentionality that really is needed here um, because there is talent everywhere. There's talent in the communities that we perceive as not having any assets. And uh, without that commitment to breaking down the barriers of segregation and disparity and all the things that create this perception of imbalance that the advocates and the donors are, uh, are, look like one thing and the beneficiaries look like another. We're perpetuating something that is not part of what I see as where society needs to go and can go. But we have an obligation, if you're in leadership, to have that lens uh, of intentionality. So that's how I see it. Would that through if you'd like to? Or I'll move. I'll move on. Yeah. Oh, you would? Well done. Okay. That's a great answer. <laughs> Um, so um, I'm conscious of the time we have a lot more questions, um, but a lot of them, um, there's a confluence of questions in one area really, which is um, how, how can the audience get involved? How can they become activists on women's and girls' issues, whether locally or globally? Um, how can they find platforms to share their stories? How can they become media makers um, and take, take charge of the story in a way that I think all of you have articulated? So strongly. So, so maybe if we just, um, as the final question, um, each of you can um, talk through if, um, if somebody leaving the room tonight, particularly maybe a young woman who wants to find that power for herself, um, is going to work, going to go away and do one thing, you know, what, what would you recommend and what is the way to take back the storytelling? Denise. Yeah. So I always say um, to wear your girl glasses. So to try to look at the world the way a young woman or a girl does and to talk to girls in your family, in your community and ask them what their hopes and their vision is and how you can help them to achieve their dreams. And that's one. The second, I think, is really to be an advocate. And whether you are a young girl, an older woman, a man, whatever you look like, um, to recognize your power to create change and to hold your elected officials responsible in terms of their commitments to women and girls. And then the last is really to invest in girls. So everyone can be a philanthropist. And whether you give $10 or whether you give 10000 to invest in girls around the world and really change what our current reality is in terms of that incredible vacuum in support for girls globally. Do you want to go? Uh, how, can we get it? how can the members of the audience get oh, involved? Oh, can I say one more thing? Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Super quick. Um, <laughs> Just that um, my communications coordinator would kill me if I didn't, but there are incredible resources on our website, which is letgirlslead.org, and people can learn more about how to host a screening, how to participate in our video contest, 
how to get engaged, donate, and support the work and help us expand this global movement. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just quickly add that 80% uh, of our membership is here in the U.S., and uh, women's foundations and women's funds are great organizations in your community that to get it in touch with, to go on the website, our website, and look at the directory of where we are, both in the U.S. and the world, and locally, don't wait for exclusive forums like this to think that you have a message to bring about gender equity, because really the goal is mainstreaming. So any network that you're in, if you walk in the door with that sensitivity to what equity looks like, uh, then use your power for where you stand. You know, do what, what you can with what you have where you are. And that in itself will help propel where we're trying to go. There's just, I mean, you have incredible organizations here. Uh, you, I recommend that people just dive in, make a commitment to um, girls and women, make it part of your daily life. You can mentor a girl, sponsor a girl, um, help a girl um, realize her potential, uh, join the orgs. Uh, clearly, you know, you can donate to the orgs, your money, your, your time, your services. Uh, there's so much that you can do. There's there's just almost too much, you know. But um, but but really, girls and girls are the future. I mean, I think of this as the Athena century, and um, I do. I, I really, you know, this is really the century where women will um, find their seats at the tables of power, and will men will um, will, will will be there and support. And uh, um, this isn't about women replacing men. This is about equality. This is about, you know, rising tide lifts all boats. We're in this together, and we need each other. So uh, it's really, I think, incumbent upon us continuing to work together, champion each other, champion each other's work. We try and do that. You all are the most collaborative. Um, I'm so grateful to you all always and um, the work you started at the International Museum of Women. You, you have incredibly collaborative organizations up here, and I really believe that together we, we will, you know, achieve parity. And I think it's, it's, you know, it's here. I feel it. But we all have to commit. Uh, and I like to, ta to um, tell young girls in particular when they kind of get stuck in their... Um, in their, their, their heads and um, um, stuck in, you know, I was just at a college on the East Coast, a Catholic college, uh, where girls were literally, there's this whole kind of notion of needing to, um, th what do they call it? They call it sort of like this effortless perfection, mm -hmm. this sort of desire to kind of be these sort of, you know, all the pressures on women these days and young girls in particular, in, in all the different categories, um, they're overwhelming. And I feel like if we can just inspire those girls to to get out of their heads and get out of focusing on themselves and think about others, um, because that's it's so intrinsic to us. You clearly have to take care of yourself, but if we can engage those girls in being agents of change, in being leaders, in changing sort of this institutional, um, I hate to use the word patriarchy, but this sort of institutional sexism and sort of the, the um, unfortunate... Um, a situation that we find ourselves in in this country in particular, um, not to replace men, but to be in concert and in partnership with men, I think that's where we're going to make a huge difference. So amen to architects of change, amen to partnership, um, and clearly you have all the resources here just to start getting involved. Can I add just one quick thing? Sorry. Uh, because some of us uh, in the room, I would imagine some of you are investors, and we're in a capitalist society and money talks. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> we, I think, Jen, or one, one of you mentioned earlier about the power of consumerism and making choices through what we purchase and so on, but also how we invest. And look at the board of directors on some of these companies. Look at how they are making their investments, because really that's another part of power that we don't pay attention to enough in the women's space because that's really what brought down apartheid. It was really boycotting businesses or being very much looking at their practices when it came to um, racial segregation in South Africa. Uh, and so I think for the women's equality globally and here in the U.S., we can bring the same kind of sophistication to our choices that we're making uh, in how we invest, mm -hmm. along with whatever everything else that was said earlier. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> so, so a 
huge thank you to everybody on the panel. I think you are such, um, such a tribute to the power of creativity, of storytelling, of activism, investment, um, but also ultimately to the power of women and girls that exist in this community and in this room. So thank you. I want to thank again Charles Schwab for being such a generous host this evening. Um, as well as PHI, um, Bay Area Alliance for Women and Girls and Let Girls Lead for putting together tonight's event. Thank you for your generosity and the spirit of collaboration. Um, and I encourage all of you um, to join us to continue the conversation and um, to find more about the resources that exist within the Bay Area to connect with women or organizations that um, you may not have met or that you may know and you want to deepen your relationship. Um, because I think you've heard so many wonderful things from the panel about how to take the next step and how to make transformation with women and girls around the world. So thank you for being here tonight. Yeah. <laughs>